Hi everyone and welcome to the revision of chapter 17, Oligopoly. Today we will speak about oligopolies and their characteristics. We will discuss the example of a duopoly and understand what is Nash equilibrium. And finally we will discuss a very interesting topic in economics, game theory. And we will discuss game theory uh, on the example of prisoner's dilemma. So let us start with the definition of an oligopoly. An oligopoly is a market structure in which only a few sellers offer similar or identical products. We have six common characteristics of oligopolies. First, few firms with large market share. Although you can have a number of smaller firms in an oligopolistic market, the majority of the market share is controlled by a few large established firms. Second, high barriers to entry. Third, interdependence. All the big players are interdependent in their decisions and, in, and particularly as we will see in their pricing decisions. Fourth, each firm has a little market power in its own right. Each of the oligopolistic companies should consider the decisions of their competitors. And thus they are limited in their market power. Fifth, higher prices than in case of perfect competition. We will see this in our example, and six oligopolies are more efficient compared to monopolies. So there are a lot of oligopolies around us. Some of the oligopolistic markets include mass media. National mass media and news outlets are a prime examples of oligopoly, with the bulk of US media outlets owned by just four corporations, Walt Disney, Comcast, Viacom, CBC, and News Corporation. New players like Amazon and Netflix have joined the mix recently with the rise of streaming media, but smaller players remain shut out. Next, smartphones. Apple, iOS, and Google Android dominate the smartphone operating system. Next, automakers. Automobile manufacturing is another example of an oligopoly, with the leading auto manufacturers in the United States being Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler. Worldwide, there are perhaps a dozen key automakers, including Toyota, Honda, Volkswagen Group, and Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi. Finally, airlines. The United States airline industry today is arguably an oligopoly. As of 2021, there are four major domestic airlines, American Airlines, Delta Airlines, Southwest Airlines, and United Airlines Holdings, which fly just at around 65% of all domestic passengers in 2020. So to understand oligopolies, let us start with an example of a duopoly. A duopoly is an oligopoly with only two members. So let's say we have a market a market of water and we have this demand schedule with prices and quantity of water measured in gallons and relative revenue of the companies. So let us firstly understand what will happen in case of perfect competition. In case of perfect competition, production decisions of each firm would drive price equal to marginal cost. And if the price will be equal to marginal cost, the total revenue uh, or the total economic profit of the company will be zero. Thus, in our example, the equilibrium quantity for perfect competition will be 120 gallons and the price will be zero because we assume in our example we do not have any marginal cost of production of water. Now also let us try to understand what will happen if this market was a monopoly. In case of a monopoly, the company will try to find profit maximizing quantity and produce at that quantity. In our case, this quantity is 60 gallons for $60 per gallon. As you can see, the profit of the company is maximized at this point. So now we have discussed what will happen in case of monopoly and what will happen in case of perfect competition. Now let us try to understand what will happen if this market is a duopoly. One case is if two companies will make an agreement and behave 
in a similar way as a monopoly. This agreement is called collusion, an agreement among firms in a market about quantities to produce or prices to charge. And the companies which enter into collusion are called cartel. However, collusion is illegal in many countries. It's illegal in the United States and it is controlled by strict antitrust laws. So let us try to understand what can happen in a duopoly if the companies cannot explicitly agree on the quantity of production. So let's say we have a situation with Jack and N. And again we have the same demand schedule as we have already discussed. And let's say Jack has some information that N is going to produce 30 gallons of water. Now, first idea of Jack is to produce another 30 gallons. So what will happen in that case? In that case, the total production will be 60 gallons and the price will be also 60 per gallon. And thus, the total profit of Jack and N will be $3,600 divided by 2, 1800 per each. However, after long deliberations, Jack considers what will happen if he produces 40 gallons. In this case, the total production will go to 70 gallons, and the price will drop to $50 per gallon. What will happen with profits? Case of N, N will lose $300 if she does not decide to change her production volume. However, in case of Jack, he will earn additional $200. So, this is a beneficial move for Jack. Of course, in real life situation, Anne may also decide to increase her production by another 10 gallons and make the total quantity of the market equal to 80 gallons. But let us firstly decide a situation in which Anne does not react to 40 gallons. And Jack thinks again, what will happen if he will produce not 40 gallons, but maybe 50 gallons this time? Now the total quantity in the market will be equal to 80 gallons. And what will happen with profits? Jack will earn zero dollars of additional profit. We can find this doing just simple calculations, multi multiplying 50 gallons by price of $40 per gallon. So there is no any sense for Jake increasing his production. At the same time, if N has responded to the Jake's decision of increasing production, 50 gallons for Jake may not only result in zero additional profit, but also result in additional loss for Jack. So there is no any sense for Jack or Anne to produce more than 40 gallons. This 40 gallons is a good example of what is called a Nash equilibrium. A Nash equilibrium is a situation in which economic actors interacting with one another, each one choose their best strategy given the strategies that all the other actors have chosen. So let us try to understand how the size of oligopoly affects the market outcome. Basically, as we have already discussed in case of a duopoly, there are two effects which have impacted the decisions of Jack and Anne. First is the output effect, because the price is above marginal cost, selling one more gallon of water at the going price will raise profit. And this was a situation when Jack considered producing 40 gallons instead of 30 gallons, increasing their profit. And the next effect is price effect. Raising production will increase the total amount sold, which will lower the price of water and lower the profit on all other gallons sold. If the output effect is larger than the price effect, the well owner will increase the production of water. If the price effect is larger than the output effect, the owner will not raise the production. As we have observed 
in case of 30 gallons and 40 gallons. Each oligopolist continues to increase production until these two marginal effects exactly balance, taking the other firm's production as given. Now let us consider how the number of firms in the industry will affect the marginal analysis of each oligopolist. The larger the number of sellers, the less each seller is concerned about its own impact on the market price. That is, as the oligopoly grows in size, the magnitude of the price effects falls. When the oligopoly grows very large, the price effect disappears altogether. That is, the production decision of an individual firm no longer affects the market price. In this extreme case, each firm takes the market price as given when deciding how much to produce. It increases production as long as price is above marginal cost. So basically, it will continue to increase the number of players in an oligopoly, will end up moving closer and closer to a perfect competition. And this is how the size of an oligopoly or the number of players in an oligopoly will affect the market outcome. Oligopolies is a perfect topic for discussion and understanding of the game theory. Game theory is the study of how people behave in strategic situations. We'll discuss game theory on the example of Prisoner's Dilemma, a particular game between two captured prisoners that illustrates why cooperation is difficult to maintain even when it is mutually beneficial. So Prisoner's Dilemma is a story about two criminals who have been captured by the police. Let's call them Bonnie and Clyde. The police have enough evidence to convict Bonnie and Clyde of a minor crime of carrying an unregistered gun, so that each would spend a year in a jail. The police also suspect that the two criminals have committed some bank robbery, but they lack hard evidence to convict them. The police questions Bonnie and Clyde in separate rooms, and basically each of them is suggested these following options. First, if they will confess in bank robbery, they will get 8 years. Second, if both of them will not confess, each of them will get 1 year for the minor crime. However, there is a trick. Each of the criminals is separately suggested a deal. If one of them will confess, he can get free. However, the other will get 20 years in prison. So, to better understand the choices of our prisoners, let's have this table. As you can see, this table summarizes all choices for Bonnie and Clyde. So, what do you think? What will Bonnie and Clyde decide to do? Let us firstly try to understand what will Clyde's decision be. Clyde can think in this way. If Bonnie will remain silent, and Clyde will remain silent as well, each of them will get one year. This is a perfect situation. However, if Clyde will decide to remain silent and Bonnie will confess, in that case, Clyde will get 20 years. So Clyde is losing 90 years here. So in case of Clyde, the best situation, if he will remain silent, is getting one year. And the worst situation is getting 20 years. Now Clyde considers what will happen if he will decide to confess. The best scenario here is that he will get free. And the worst scenario here is that if both Clyde and Bonnie will decide to confess, he will get eight years. As you can see, both the best and worst scenarios in case of decision to confess are better than the scenarios in case of a decision to remain silent. The worst that the Clyde can get if he confess, he will get 8 years. 8 years, not 20. And now we can also make this thought experiment from Bonnie's side. We will find that both Clyde's and Bonnie's best optimal scenario is to confess. 
because they minimize their loss. And what they ultimately will decide to do? To minimize their loss, both of them will most probably confess. Although it was more beneficial for each of them to remain silent. So confessing is a dominant strategy both for Bonnie and Clyde. The dominant strategy is a strategy that is the best for a player in a game, regardless of the strategies chosen by the other players. And now we can apply the prisoner's dilemma uh, to an oligopolistic market. Let's say we have now Jack and Jill, two economic players in in an oligopoly. Again, as you can see, if we start our thought experiment from Jill's side, we can see that in case of 30 gallons, both the best and the worst outcomes for Jill are worse than the scenarios in case of 40 gallons. And the same goes to Jack's. And again, as you can see, although cooperation could be more beneficial for both Jill and Jack, earning them 1800 profit, the dominant strategy for them will be producing 40 gallons and earning only 1600 profit. This is the loss minimizing strategy. This is the optimal strategy and in economics this is called dominant strategy. So this was the revision of chapter 17, Oligopoly. I hope it was useful. Thank you and as always, please like and subscribe.